Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Sherlock. Uh, greetings from sunny Los Angeles to San Francisco. This is the Dramaturgy of Video Games Theater, Story, and Empathy, which is a part of the game Narrative Summit. So let's get this started. So talking about why this talk, how did this come to be? Um, I saw the chat earlier, saw all the theater uh, kids in our audience sprinkling in. Uh, this kind of came to me when I went to my first E3 back in 2018, and I realized when I was talking to folks at different events, so many folks had been cast or crew in, you know, theater plays in high school, or they did a theater undergrad, or they just really loved musical theater, and they listened to musical theater all the time in their car, and we just talked about this shared love of theater. So I was like, there has to be something there about that connection, about game dev to theater pipeline, and vice versa. So previous GDC academic topics on the subject did talk a lot about immersive theater and LARPing, uh, but not really just too comparing and contrasting of the two different mediums and what they mean to each other and how they relate to each other. And this was true for my own story and for my own path. My most recent uh, project was inspired by Tennessee Williams plays taking place in the rural South United States. And then I actually do a lot of work on camera hosting, which is so much like performing and acting. It's basically the same thing. And that was kind of a grew out of, right? I was at an event. I had a broadcast producer who said, hey, Abby, you can talk, go on camera. And I said, cool. All right, here I am, I guess. And kind of that progression I noticed happens for a lot of other people. And actually my first professional experience was actually at the La Jolla Playhouse, uh, not in gaming, but in theater. So as an actor, uh, kind of again, a rundown of why I'm so passionate about this. I've been an actor for more than a decade, done Shakespeare, Greek tragedy. I'm stage combat certified, can do swords, knives, ow, getting hit hitting others, trained at UCLA, Boston University, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. So this is really in my blood, I would say at this point, for the gaming industry, I've interned kind of all over Wizards of the Coast, some voiceover stuff, uh, hardware, and then Nerdist and Geek and Sundry. Yeah, and just kind of what I've done in the space, but talking about, we're gonna refer back to my project heirloom, which is heavy work with performers and VO. And I was a game developer on it, but also a producer and the director, right, of those performers. And it all leads us back to how are these two places tied together, right? So I argue that empathy in games and empathy in theater are the only two forms of storytelling that require active, and I mean active participation from the audience or the player. So I, again, this is my hot take, right? That video games are the most highly evolved form of theater. So we're using technology, right? As a conduit of empathy and in storytelling instead of live performance. Again, nothing I'm saying really is new, but hopefully the framing of it can be used in accessible and productive ways for teams to enrich their stories. What can we creatively steal from the oldest art form around? So how is this different from books and film? We love our books, big, you know, we love reading, we love movies, but these are very different mediums and they require different kinds of engagement with their audience. So for games, right, the player has to actively move something in real time, unless a cut scene and it happens on its own. But even then you might have to press something analog to have something else happen, but you have to actively move something. If I wanna go left, I'm gonna take my scroller and go left. And then with theater, right, the audience has to watch actively in real time. So that means I have to, you know, I'm engaged, I'm watching, and then the performers have to perform actively in real time, exactly kind of like players do. And you have to be actively watching in these media that is changing as you're watching, right? You cannot stay static. You have to keep momentum for them. And you say, how is this different, Abby, from a book or a film? I watch that and it happens. So if for the book, if I'm reading a book and it says the character went left and I'm like, what if they went right instead? They can do that in a game and then in theater, theater metaphor time, if I'm a performer and I'm giving a joke and I notice that the audience reacted differently, I can change my joke, right, in real time to give the audience more space for laughter or I can go quicker if I need to. That kind of active, I'm like, this activeness that's happening is special. And it, again, we love our books and we love our movies, but it's not kind of the same, right? So the actor within player and performer, and I'm gonna use you know, these roles, right? That the actor portrays character on stage. 
that's our theater. And then games, the player portrays character on screen. So we both have characters, but we have the medium being different and the role being different. And I, again, argue that they are the exact same functions, really, in control screen, but they are different mediums. And again, I use this with, you know, first person player that I am the character. I am that character moving on screen and then acting. I am that performer. I, we can talk, you can talk about method later and I am the character versus portraying, but you are that character, right? And so when we're talking about empathy, I broke this kind of down into three factors that I think really kind of sum up all of these kind of similarities between these two worlds. Biggest one I believe is empathy. You know, empathy, the definition being the practice of feeling close to emotionally and personally to someone other than yourself. And I gave this little quote of, I might watch someone cry at a movie theater or be moved to tears myself, but I myself am not crying as the character within their specific situation like I would be in games or theater. And so again, that actor within character and player within character. And this is a type of relationship that I have to emphasize that is rarely able to be recreated in other mediums. Again, theater and games, unlike movies and books, are not static and are active. And I think this identification process is never so tightly wound as it is within these two mediums, because I think just the, again, activeness of their situations lend it to us of identification. And again, for all my D&D &D players out there where you become the character or you're LARPing and you become your character, very similar, very similar. And I use this example here, one of our favorites, Mr. Tom Hiddleston as Hamlet by William Shakespeare, and then Link, one of our, also one of our favorites from The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. I use this example of a Wii remote and this was uh, the first Sky Resort came out in the Wii before the re-release on Switch, I would use the Wii as the master sword. And I, as Link, was making those cuts on those enemies. And then the actor with Tom Hiddleston uh, as Hamlet, there is that fear, right, that he's making these cuts and strokes. And we don't know. We're, we hope, right? Player safety, I'm a stage captain. They're going to be okay. We hope our, you know, our ensemble, everyone, all the actors are going to be safe. But there's that you don't know what's going to happen. It's live theater. Maybe what's going to happen with the sword. And that similar kind of what if is also in Legend of Zelda. Because if I don't put my arm right, I, I might die, right? And so that level of I don't know-ness is really important and potent. And so another factor, we have empathy. Now we're talking about catharsis. So it is a release of emotions for the audience or player. So emotionally purging oneself is beneficial for humans and innate even if you don't know it, what we look for in narratives. But this goes back all the way to funeral dirges and wailing within Greek theater and laments where you would just, ah, you would yell because there was nothing else you could do to get that deep emotion out of you, right? And again, it doesn't have to be as dramatic as that, but we are looking for some sort of release from our day-to-day -day lives and our stories. And so it is, again, I said, hopefully brings resolution, right? We're looking for our stories. Storytelling was used originally to talk with others, share stories, um, make sense of natural phenomenon, but it also asks us to make sense of ourselves and how we operate, right? And the questions we need to ask ourselves through our stories. And I think this is super important when you're asking for catharsis within your narrative. What am I looking for? What catharsis am I looking for within my narrative from as a designer standpoint and then also a player standpoint? And I give these kind of very broad uh, action verbs to escape, to feel less alone, to laugh, to cry, to journey, to feel. Um, but they could be, you know, broken down much smaller after that. But kind of what do you want that player to feel? What catharsis are you aiming for at the end of that experience? Like you see here, strong emotional catharsis in both of these, Ellie and the Last of Us 2, and then the Trojan Women by Euripides. And then performance, three. So we have empathy, catharsis, performance. Someone in the audience maybe is saying, I'm not performing, Abby, when I'm eating some chips and I'm laying on my couch in my living room, playing on my game console. That's not performance. I'm relaxing. Okay, we're going to reframe it. So the act of performing on stage is an actor within character. And then the act of performing within screen as player within character. I always say this as uh, you know, friends with a lot of actors myself, if they're by themselves in a room and they're monologuing, they're still an actor and they're still performing even if they're by, if they're by themselves. So even if you're by yourself, uh, 
you're still performing, right? And they both do, both of these mediums require the willing suspension of disbelief to give into these performances. You enter into an agreement, right? That I know this world is not real, but I fully will pretend that it is. And I have to greet it with openness that I will be affected by what I am seeing in this medium. I will allow myself to feel, right? And that kind of easiness into that is not always, you know, a given, but if you, again, we want to embrace these things as with openness in our hearts for them to change us as much as possible. Uh, and then I had to add, as someone with a marketing background who's worked with influencers and talent and streamers, that game platforms with streamers are performers role-playing publicly. I, I'm shocked that we don't talk about this more. Like you see with Meg Mage here for Cyberpunk 2077 playing, it's so meta <laughs> with Twitch because you have a streamer who is, you know, I am performing for my audience, for my Twitch chat, and they, a lot of streamers are also performers, right? And then they're also this LARPing, this role playing that's happening within the game, right? So it's a really cool phenomenon. And then also some lovely performances in theater. You see the great James Earl Jones and Cecily Tyson. So cool, Abby, we've talked about, you know, how are they similar, how they beautifully cross over. Give me some practicalities, help me out. I want to, you know, incorporate more of this with my writing team. I'm a small indie studio and I just want my narratives to be stronger. How can we use these principles of drama for game developers? So dramaturgy as world building for game designers. Then we're gonna cover structure, plot and development. And then my favorite probably actor objective work within game scripts for developing stronger characters. So dramaturgy is not um, even in the drama world, I would say, is kind of like in the background. People don't talk about it as much, but it's so cool. Um, I just, I, it's really neat. Not everyone is always super lucky to have a dramaturg on their staff. Um, in the past productions I've been in, our second assistant director was also the dramaturg. So some people can double it up, but there are uh, programs out there where you can get a, you know, a degree in dramaturgy. But it is its definition, the study of dramatic composition and representation of those main elements on the stage. So that, that means your dramaturg is a researcher, right, of your script and your world. So it is adjacent to a writer. They work a lot with words. Uh, they're basically your lore keeper for all my ner fellow nerds in the audience. They keep your lore. They know what the characters wants and their needs and how they operate. And I'm gonna give some examples that if you're in you know, game design, you could hire a consultant for dramaturg work who specializes maybe in that genre that you are working in, the theme, or have individual people on your staff that maybe have an interest in it or a background in theater, tasked to do it if they're interested. Some examples here with Shell Games, they did an awesome job where they are working on a food game, food VR game, right? And you have different cultures, all different cultures have all different cool foods. So they reached out to academic masters of their crafts on different food to kind of serve as dramaturgs on that subject for the game. And then I personally uh, knew much of the staff for uh, How to Defend Yourself by Liliana Padilla, which is about a group of women learning self-defense on a college campus. And so what uh, Liliana did is had a bunch of uh, women, since it was about Greek American life, sorority women, ask them questions about, you know, what is the specific lingo you're using? Why do you have these practices? And those women kind of acted as dramaturgs, right? To give Liliana the kind of lay of the land of how this world, right? Which she didn't know much about how it operated. And that made her life writing so much easier, right? So world building research, and I give these kind of little bullet points you can write down um, or just things you can ask yourself, right? Eternally when you're writing. So as a dramaturg would ask themselves all of these. I should know all the rules and specifics of how this place operates, politically, ethnically, socially, culturally, religiously. What are the demographics? What's the history? All those who love backstories, this kind of, it works in right here. I should know metaphysical expressions and specific lingo used in the world. Word choice is so important. I, I cannot emphasize that enough. Why people say the words that they say says so much about them and their character. I think of the example of y'all. I'm originally from South Carolina. And when I hear someone use the word y'all, I immediately think, Oh, are they from the South? Where did they learn that? Do they have a family member? And it sets you off on a path, right? And so word choice is important. When I say that, maybe it tells you a bit about me, right? And if you're doing your character, their specific word choice would tell you a bit about them. So again, why this word choice? 
how could that word be used in different situations? Does it change meaning if it's used in different situations? And also, does it mean something deeper if the word is used multiple times? You should know the history and cultural importance of other comparables in the genre. Knowing what else is out there is gonna be so helpful and knowing what's already been done. Don't remake the wheel, you know, and seeing what people have done really well. And then how can we learn from the design of this genre and other developers? What are the expectations? Are your players gonna be angry if you don't have a specific, you know, UI element that's typical of that? And there's all these, but for character, right? You say, are there expectations of how relationships operate? If we don't give them that, are they gonna be frustrated? And then again, what did these other comparables do well? What did they not do well? And I say this with no shade or shame of like, oh, not good. But just being self-aware about what you like as a designer and what you're looking for, um, I think it's holistic, right? You want a holistic viewpoint. And so second thing we've talked about, the so dramaturgy, narrative structure. So another technical duty the dramaturg could do to help the actors or director would be breaking down usually in a chart or some other graphic form is your uh, emotional beats, right? And I personally, someone ADHD, if you can't tell, uh, I love kinesthetic graphs. They're so helpful with sharing with other people, with your ensemble, with your team, kind of your emotional beats. You can write about it and you can talk about it, but when you can show a graphic of it, it's just really impactful. So you should have a physical copy of the emotional beats or narrative track in a graph or visual form. Uh, again, this is something a director would know or a writer would know. And I have this really great uh, game project macro uh, courtesy of Richard Lamartian, uh, one of my professors for my project heirloom. But you can kind of see here how helpful this is because we went through every single moment in our script, in our game, and you charted it out. So your sequence, right? So what is it? Uh, characters encountered, who are you meeting, your brief description of events happening, the location of where that is, the player mechanics. So what is the player doing? But this I think is our little golden nugget here is player goal. So what does the player want in that moment? Music like little arrows in my hand. And then designer goal. What do I as a designer want to communicate in that moment, right? And they could be different things. They could be the same thing, but they could definitely be different things if they need to be. But I think the most important is the emotional beat. What is, what are all of those elements leading you towards? They should all be in focus of that. And that's gonna give you such a high level of control with your narrative, if you're doing a linear narrative, that you're just gonna be in such better shape. And then if you all, do have scoping issues, right? Or if you're talking about like, I need this to be shorter, um, you can look right at your emotional beats and see, is this in service of, right? As a creative, we're in, hopefully in service of our projects and of you know making them the best that they can be. Is this in service of the project? Is this in service of the emotional beat that this moment is leading to? You might need to cut then if it's not. So again, this can take many different forms. A lot of y'all know already the Cambillion Hero's Journey or a classic rising action, falling action, just being able to track it in some kind of physical structure, right? So again, structure of the holistic project. I should know the writer's journey of the whole experience and be able to map it on a visual chart. Where is the beginning, the middle, and the end? If it's an on rails narrative, does this make sense to the player? And when I mean on rails, I mean like, no A, B, C, or D choices. You just got your one choice and that's it. You're on the rails narrative, Captain, now. Um, and then do I know the flow and rhythm of the piece, right? Does it slow down at certain parts? Is it too speedy? What's its pacing? It needs to be intentional. If it's really slow and everyone's like, oh my gosh, like it just keeps going and go, then you're probably going to need to cut something, right? Because your flow and rhythm is going to tell you a lot about how playtesting is going to go too. And then I... I have to mention this because I have such respect for branching narratives, but even harder if it's a branching narrative, the acclaimed open world, but does this make sense to the player through each separate storyline? I know as a player myself, there is nothing more frustrating than picking another path than maybe the most popular one and seeing that it's not as enriching, right? It's not super impactful as maybe that main path would be. And so how can we as designers make that path less traveled by, more enriching and valid? I think it goes back to this emotional beat structure where you're gonna need to iron out the emotional beat of every single path, right? And that's huge scope, but it is something if you wanna nail it down, it's gonna be really powerful. And even if I said there's an ideal path, 
I want as the player to feel like my choice, no matter what, is valid. So again, really good and difficult narrative design is when you can track each of these through a branching narrative and they all hit equally, right? So our third thing we're gonna talk about is character work. So character work. Often an outside actor will do this once you give them a script. You've written your script, I'll get my script, I'll write it up, mark it up, as you can see in this lovely example of House Husbands by Keith Thompson. If someone on your team can do this, uh, or a performance director can, usually they will automatically. It can really help uh, clarify when recording. When I direct my script is, I like analog copies. I don't, you know, I just want to feel it in my hand and I mark it up. It is different colors, lots of writing on it. And you're using these tools of after study, right? to use game narratives that can make characters richer and more thought out. And a dramaturg usually will also do this, not, you know, again, you're not doing the actor's job for them and you're not doing the director's job for them, but as writers, right, or as designers, you are nailing down kind of the exacts of this world. You're making this, this I use a sandbox analogy, you're using a sandbox, you're giving them the constraints of the sandbox so then they can go around and play in it. But you need to establish what the constraints are or you're just going to be, I don't know, you're not going to know where, where you're playing it. So psychological theories and objectives, right? So I should be able to go through the script and break up a character's changing objectives through each scene. Objectives. Objectives are super important after work because it means, I use the example of hunger. I was really hungry, y'all, when I woke up this morning. My objective was I would like some food. And then I had some food and then I was not hungry anymore. My objective changed. That's the very simple way of TLDR of using an objective, right? And so our objectives as humans and as characters are ever changing, right? Um, so usually I would go through and see kind of what are my objectives throughout the script. So, and this is super important, I would say for character work is what is their objective overall? What is, what's their big grand master plan? What would they love to have? What do they see at the pearly gates? What grounds them, right? So these are like these big life searching questions that are fun, right? As writer, writers to discover about characters. And then what are they motivated by? It could be money, love, fame, family, et cetera. What keeps their engine turning? What makes them go? And then this I think is almost the most important part that no one talks about as much is how. All of character depends on the how. How do they go about getting their objective? And we really break this down into action verbs and theater, which is you use these action verbs within lines. I'll, I'm going to do an example, but you would have a line and you would have this, you know, with this line, I want to do this action verb, which is how I get my objective. So if the line was, I want the papers, please. Let's try that with to entice. I want the papers, please. So that was enticing, yeah. And then we're gonna try to punch, okay. I want the papers, please. My face changed, your voice changed, audio changed, everything changed, right? And so action verbs can be really helpful if you are small in scope on your team and you need to direct action verbs. That's a great way to already like get you started on directing. And then what's the subtext of a line? You don't need to do this with every line. Again, like I'm saying, everything here is just a suggestion, things to help you out, more tools in your tool belt. Uh, but subtext of lines can be really important if it's a very intentional moment that a lot of hinges on that, maybe that, that dialogue. So what I say versus what I actually mean. Another example, we have a, you're doing a great job, honey, is the script. So I actually mean it. You're doing a great job, honey. <laughs> Oh, she's so happy. She loves honey. Sweet. Okay. Then she does not think honey is doing a great job. You're doing a great job, honey. Completely different, right? We're using different resonators. It's all different. So subtext is super, super important and fun to work out. I should know the relationships between characters and why they are the way you are. All my writers that they are saying, oh my God, my backstories work. Ooh, ooh. Yes. Uh, you typically would not give your backstory to an actor because um, that would be like a lot of information to like process. But if you have a dramaturg, that would be great. Or if the actor does have questions, right? And you do have that answer in your backstory, that could be a good time to say, well, actually, now that you ask, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it could work out. And then why are they this way, this character this way? Where did they come from right before this scene started? And where are they going? This is so helpful when you're acting because 
acting is fantasy, right? And so this grounds you, it lets you know, what are the logistics of my reality? And so knowing again, where, when is super important for performers. So examples of performance practices for some of your game teams, you have, can you hold a read through for your script, right? Where you're going to read through the script, but I'm tush, wonder why they named it that. But there you can do table work. And even if you don't have professional actors, please, please, please read it out loud. I cannot emphasize enough how I think writers are like, wow, I didn't realize it sounded like that until you said it. And so having someone else read your words as they are on the page is going to be so helpful because you can listen and take notes of what feels good and what's like a little awkward and we're like, oh, that, that needs to go or like, ooh, that could stay. And so having that is just going to make your process so much easier. And again, does not have to be professional actors, can be your friends, can be your parents can be whoever would like to read for you. And then can you record your talent together if you have voiceover actors? Please do this, this is so cool. Um, it's helpful for performances and it's really uh, bonding. And you can see the ensemble building relationships, their performances are more nuanced because they're listening to each other. Um, and it's really hard, right, when we're remote, Zoom, uh, but I just did this this past fall where I directed two voice actors in their own booths and they were listening to each other and we got great performances that were super intertwined because they just, you know, they could listen to each other IRL instead of, you know, being in the solitary booth by themselves. Uh, so if you can do this, I know it's hard with scheduling. I really would recommend it. So there are some comparables within the space professionally that I had to mention, right? Um, this, you know, different, like, literally same duties, different medium of, you know, roles within the industry that I just think are so similar or similar duties and different name of folks who are maybe a little different, but we kind of do the same function, right? Um, I think when we recruit from different spaces, we're going to get diversity of experiences, backgrounds of different sorts of folks. I was super lucky that my program at USC, I didn't really have a lot of game dev background, right? I did a lot of marketing and social media, but I didn't have a lot of dev experience. I had a lot of theater experience and I feel really lucky for that opportunity to be in the space. And I think I would love to see more folks, right? Uh, from theater, if they're interested, right? And bring them in and diversity only makes the games industry better by having more folks of different intersectionality backgrounds and able to, you know, give us more feedback and different like perspectives on what we need. And so as a designer, a designer should always, you know, have many knowledge their fingers in many knowledge pools, right? Because it's only going to make you stronger. And so that was a lot of talking. So we're going to bring it to our conclusion, right? Is it solves my question when I was at that E3 hangout is why are there so many theater people in this industry? Is this like the natural path for all of this? And I see all of you in the chat, like, wow, there really is something here. And I think it is that we literally have very similar roles or literally the same positions and practices. And it is a path, right, that we should see as reasonable as computer tech uh, or uh, computer science or tech. And like I said, it would be just really cool to see read throughs at different places and just more carrying over at these practices because they're only gonna make us stronger, right? So in conclusion, thematically, there is a reason these are kids flock to game dev. It feels like home. Games are my favorite medium. I think they're the most evolved art form possible. They're more accessible to more people. Theater is not, we love theater, obviously, if we're in this talk, but it's not super accessible. And games have the ability, like TV did back in the 1950s, to go into people's living rooms and be there in their heart, in their home. And we can make these games that make people empathize with each other more because that identification process, right, with characters is never stronger than it is in games or theater. And we can make the world, why I'm in games, to make the world a better place, right? And so practically, I hope all of you in the audience can maybe take some of these practices and bring them back to your studios, uh, your teams, and make your game stories richer, stronger, and more impactful. So I do have some future resources and citations. If you're interested, if you were like, we need to read more on this, uh, there you go. There's a lot of these that I think would be really helpful. I have to give a thank you to Professor Melinda Finberg of Critical Drama Studies, Hannah Nicklin, PhD, and Professor Richard Lamartian of Game Design at USC for his game design uh, outline that we used earlier. Also a shout out to the mentors uh, who helped me with this and the summit advisors of the Narrative Game Summit for making my first, this is my first GDC talk. Thank you uh, for selecting me and allowing me to talk about this um, and help others. 
So that is it. I have my website here, my email and my social media. We will not have time, unfortunately, for questions. But if you do have questions, please feel free to DM me, um, mostly on Twitter would be good. But if you would like to stay in contact, please, here I am. I am looking for full-time roles uh, with production, uh, directing or working with actors after graduation uh, for in, for in May from USC. But I wanna thank you all so much and I hope you have a great rest of your GDC. Bye. Thank you.